Welcome to another dimension. A dimension of insight. A dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is Off Planet Radio. Good evening, wherever, whenever you are. This is Off Planet Radio, the podcast version. Um, as we discussed in the last show, what we're doing right now is we're downsizing, kind of. But we're doing it for a good reason, because we want to get shows out faster and we want to get more content out to the people. And so uh, what we're basically doing is we've kind of um, moved back to what works for us, the, uh, the audio thing without all the video. You'll get videos from time to time as we kind of go through uh, the next few months and some transitions that we're doing. Talked about that on the last show. It, it's just one of those days the energies are kind of strange, which is good because our guest dog, Telez, is with us. He's, he's, he's going to spin off into some things that I think people need to hear. Um, before we do that, there's something I got to say about the state of division that exists within the body politic of humanity right now, as reflected by the body politic in the United States. The 2016 election, the aftermath, the inauguration, the aftermath, all of it is designed to continue to split the consciousness of humanity. And um, I have to say that in watching the debacle that has played out, I think it's time to begin calling people out of the system and begin pulling away from the structural dynamics that are emotionally, psychically, and energetically still trying to pull you back into the uh, collective consensus reality. Um, we talked about this on the last show as well, about the fact that really there are those who are separated out. I don't mean that in an elitist way. But the forerunners of humanity right now sense the pull. And the predatory nature of what has been lurking around us and above us, the controlling system, wants to keep pulling us back into their jackpot. So, you know, I'm saying this for myself. This is a memo to self. It's a memo to you. We need to set the controls for the heart of the sun right now and forget about what's going on in the plastic culture of politics and society in general. And with that, we're going to launch into the conversation with our guest, Og Telez. And uh, with me is Emily Moyer, my co-host. Welcome, guys. Hey. Welcome, Og. This conversation has been a long time coming. I know Brandy and I have both had the opportunity to have uh, informal chats with you, but um, welcome formally to the show for the first time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Look forward to an interesting chat. You know, on your blog you write uh, basically not a, not only is everything you know incorrect but it's so wildly incorrect that the truth literally causes anyone who p witnesses it to go absolutely undeniably insane for at least a period of time and that's usually with training and conditioning i i would say that that describes the common experience that we have emily and i have talked about this for hours and i think the awakening process, once you probe the depths of deception in our reality stream, is so disorienting and so dark that really it requires a breakdown of your entire cognitive system and your neural network in order to reboot into something that can then begin to grasp the wide scope nature of this. And Og, you you identify yourself as being part of special access programs, uh, secret space program, no lab programs, cloning. I mean, it's it's the whole 
batch of things that experiencers have been talking about on this show for about seven years. In waking up to who you were and what happened, was that, in fact, what you experienced as well, just this complete collapse of your own sense of realness about the, the sense of who you are and what you are in terms of this current ontological structure? Kind of. Well, I, I kind of had gone through that earlier on as part of the programs themselves. I went through a formal awakening, which I like to use the term unlocking, maybe because I'm uniquely, um, stubbornly unique, um, whereas everyone just calls it the awakening. And as well, it kind of has its characteristic intonation, if you will, as far or implication as far as going from one sense of unawareness into a new sense of wakefulness. And there's, you know, heavy alchemical and occultic connections there. But the formal sense is that it was basically an operation in itself. Basically, I had people to help me through it, which is I had multiple teams of people. They, they did to me what is basically going to happen to the aspects of the population that are going to be able to hold together for the truth. And it, a lot of this was described as being done out of necessity because of what's a, the so-called mind virus that's plaguing the civilization and getting to a critical, basically, mass point where something has to be done or we'll go, we'll be too far past the point of being able to overturn the general uh, spiritually degrading trend. And so, you know, those, those ego death moments or what kind of, for a lot of people, instigates later on what they determine to be, uh, or at least they, they call a gang stalking and things like that of realizing something isn't correct about reality or the way that we're being informed of reality and the decisions that are made. I kind of had that earlier on just because of the, the upbringing, which is basically a lot of psychological programming. And ultimately, these, these uh, programs that are, are considered part of the secret space program, which, you know, me and Emily had a, a, chat, a chat about that a little bit with yeah. the reality of yeah. the space, with the reality of uh, the space program. And uh, basically, you know, what, what's really being hinted at with that. However, that is, there are inner spaces, and this may relate to or correlate to these so-called outer spaces that, you know, our civilization has been looking at for thousands of years and in the solar system. And so earlier on, I was getting sent to these other locations, these other frequencies of human solar civilization, the, the, the soul of, you know, the universe, if you will, or whatever we're connected to as this we're part of a civilization. And that civilization is part of a, basically an ecosystem, you know, as far as our, our bodies and our minds. And that's part of this frequency band that fits into a spectrum of existence within a multidimensional universe that we're a part of. So we were getting blasted around. A lot of that has to do with something that they called a trip chair earlier on, which is basically a device that channels the person's consciousness into a, I believe, a, a digital format, and then basically more or less beams it into what we would call uh, space or outer space or however you want to look at that. Right. And the idea behind that is that you, you, you access different times and spaces, and so it's kind of invigorating, to tell you the truth. Imagine a sensory deprivation tank that allows you to go in and out of time. Starting, you know, in a fractal expanse from your specific subframe or your frame of reference as you here and now into the one right next to it and the one right next to that into larger and larger concentric expansions until you're in some other place where you are another person or thing belonging to another civilization and everything's kind of flip-flopped. And so it's, it's interesting. It's more interesting than it was damaging or abuse. Abusive. However, a lot of this is damaging or potentially damaging because of uh, the nature of it. You know, they use children for that because uh, an adult yeah. who had their beliefs yeah. in place would be basically devastated. So what I'm trying to say here is that going through that at the age of nine, you know, nine or 10, a few times in between, uh, cause you don't really do it the whole time. I don't even know what that would equal, but they did develop the next generation technology where they opened up the stargates basically after that. And, um, you know, going through that, I never really fully believed what I saw on TV, what I, what I read in the academic books. I never really fully bought into that. However, you know, a little bit later on, I did have these type of disillusion moments, uh, disillusionment maybe, um, where uh, you, it, it builds up in you and you can't allow yourself to continue on with this type of charade. 
where you're interacting and you're in these, these groups of people and, you know, these, these jobs and, you yeah. know, it's really satisfying you in, on a spiritual level. So I did have that. And the truth is right when I got to the peak of that, where I was, you know, juicing a lot, I decided where I was going to go in life. That's where they gave me the awakening. And it was kind of described that if I they didn't do it, then I would have never returned. But I would have convinced myself everything was just, you know, a dream or a memory and, and, and strove for making a better, you know, version of the world. But that would have basically been like delusionment or you going into the delusion. And so, uh, so yeah, but the, the basis of it is cracking the, uh, the egg, the cosmic egg, if you will, and exposing the, the hidden aspects of the subconscious of the psychology. And through that reality, it doesn't really destroy the conscious view of it, but it expands it into so much more to the point where it's no longer referenced. It's almost no longer recognizable. And so that's heavily part of it is what this is all about because society, uh, they're not really prepared for that. You know, if their team loses or if the person they didn't vote for who was just going to kick them in the nuts anyway, mm -hmm. doesn't do what they want, they, they cry and, and, and pout about it. So what are you going to do when their whole reality flips upside down because, and you have to tell them, well, that's how it always was. Nothing changed. You changed. You just realized the truth now. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. exactly. That's part of kind of what we're doing here is putting mm -hmm. information out there. We're basically, we're basically chipping away at the, at, the, at the paradigm, which is really what we've been doing for a long time. In a sense, to me, it feels like almost like trying to take down a glacier with an ice pick right now. And that was part of where I wanted to go with you tonight is we are told that we live on a planet in a solar system and on this planet are 7 billion people. And that the people who are on this planet comprise what I was calling the body politic of this reality stream. People are born, people die, they're exiting in and out of the matrix. This is your experience. This is where you landed and then boom, you know, one day you're gone. And most people lather onto that then some spiritual system that allows them a get out of jail free card, um, life after death, reincarnation, salvation, resurrection, all of these exotic concepts that come from religion that really don't and never did for me certainly answer the, the, the larger questions of the nature of reality. In other words, it feels like we were dropped into this and then given literally no mechanism in which to navigate what we now, as we go through an awakening, as we're opened up of understanding that this is really an infinite stream of information fields that we're navigating and that um, in order to navigate them effectively, we need access to information that has been deliberately hidden from us. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, basically, we're encased in, you could even say, seven to eight or nine concentric layers of programming. Nine. And each one successively, <laughs> or successively must be peeled back. And, you know, the further you get to the truth, the farther you are from this comfortable zone uh, where it's kind of like we don't really have self-responsibility for what's going on in the world but we in the same sense we don't have our self-responsibility for what's happening to ourselves personally for how we tie into this control system and the ongoings in the world we you know we might have we might make a few decisions here and there that in, in uh, interrelate with politics or the ecosystem or whatever but it's largely a facade to to kind of pass the buck on to, to somebody else and spiritually that it opens people up for manipulation, but when we convince ourselves that that's the only way, it's kind of like a band-aid on a much larger issue. And as well, it is a uh, when we when we get what we want through that, we kind of it's like kind of like an auto-generated placebo effect through the the spirit and the mind. When you know prayers are answered for one day, but then the rest of the year they're they're not, or however that's going to work. And I do, there's you know power in what we call prayer or putting our mind out there. You know. It's just then if you filter that through another person, well, that person is going to eat up all that power for their own keep for themselves. Um, and it opens up into the basis of fear-based programming and trauma-based mind control. If we have fear-based programming that we determine our position in authority in reality, then that means trauma-based mind control will work. 
So you need people in a fear-based, kind of like a pleasure pain duality for how they're going to integrate and choose which path they go on in order for trauma-based mind control to work. And this is basically what's happening with these world events. Maybe you can call them false flags or just the base level programming of the threat of uh, poverty and the scarcity system that people are, they're told that, you know, is the, the, the way of the world that we're in a void. We're in a, a limited resource area. There's too many people. It's overpopulated. The threat of war is looming ever, yeah. Yeah. ever imminent. It's made to look very gloomy. But if you just twist one of the variables, it's completely reversed. And it's the opposite. It's, you know, we're in a, a place where all we, we with our maybe a void, if you want to call it that, that you can see if you can, you know, you can't touch it. So you can't really know for sure. But all you can really see and feel and uh, interact with here is abundance. That's all you have around you is people and resources to, you know, because people don't want to work with each other and pass the resources along, that doesn't mean that they're not there. You know, it might be a crappy situation, but at that point, then we have an, abund uh, an abundance of resources. We have a scarcity of human emotion at that point. Um, so it doesn't mean yeah. the world is, is that way. It's that we're making it that way. So you can change it. And it's all about perspective. And that power of perspective, though, is it's a trick. It's a trap because once if you control that for the masses, then you are, in, in essence, their lord. You, you control what's going to happen. In essence, by what they're going to think about and where they're going to put their, their power, which, which really goes deep. I don't want to get too deep too early on, but uh, if you, no, you can't, you can't be too deep too early, my friend, <laughs> you know, because we can spin this off in a lot of different ways. But the core of what you're, what you're talking about right now is, is really critical because it's base level understanding for some people. We have been taught, and this goes back to even when I was a kid, I kept looking at the world and going, Based on what I know of just my universe, the place that I lived in physically, the, the land that I walked on, the waters I saw, it appeared to me that everything we needed was right here. It appeared to me that there was no shortage, but there was this artifice that was inserted into the system that they called the financial system, money. And suddenly money became the denominator of all things good and in order to obtain it, if you grew up as I did in an upper middle class family, you were taught work hard, go to school, be honest, get a good education, get a good job. I did none of these things. And <laughs> I was mystified by the fact that I was expected to be like a monkey jump, jumping through hoops for things that it appeared to me could be effortlessly generated. And it's not that I'm lazy. It's not that I was even uninspired. I simply didn't feel motivated by the system that they presented to me. The things I wanted to do and the things I loved and it inspired me were not things that it looked likely that people were going to pay me to do anyway. So at some point, you know, like you were speaking of earlier, we kind of start to make value decisions within the system itself. And it's kind of like, okay, so what's the bare minimum functionality we can attain while maintaining integrity? And, and this was important. Um, integrity is important, not from the, the outward version of it, the inner integrity, preserving the inner psychological integrity, because I felt based on my experiences, based on everything I knew about myself, reflected out into the world that my inner field integrity was jeopardized by this poisonous system. And so what most people are looking at is the externalized system. And most people have never looked at their own inner landscape to discover how they can reestablish their footprint as a soul. And this really goes into the area where I begin to look at the culture and realize that much of the culture is in a sense spiritually dead. Am I, am I off the track there? Am I uh, kind of navigating this in, in a way that makes sense? Well, even with uh, one of the last things I was going to say is that they're, they're gaining the power through that, you know, by controlling the imagination, you can control what people are going to think about and that's what they're going to create. And you can control the etheric generation of society, you know, like a Wizard of Oz or something. Mm -hmm. That's what that's about. We all should know. And, uh, and that comes <laughs> to the creation of a society and reality and ultimately the creation of culture or the generation of culture where they are modifying country by country, nation by nation, subculture, subgroup, uh, 
you know, by, by group, the culture that they're going to attach themselves to. And they mirror the minds of people in these types of, you know, almost like uh, diagrams they develop so that everything maps it out. And so it's in my, you know, to touch on what you just said, in my opinion, it's not, I kind of like to, no, I really do not worry about insulting people because telling people the truth is insulting them. So if we're going <laughs> to we're mainly about telling people the truth, then we're going to have to accept that we're going to be insulting at some point in time. Yeah, exactly. So there's, a, there's a kind of guideline as far as, you know, spiritually void or dead. Imagine, you know, pretend there that we're not trying to insult people because if we're only insulting them or we're not giving them the truth, then we're kind of missing the mark just a little bit. So it's maybe not. And also, if it was entirely dead, there'd be no point in controlling what's here. It would be like fake gold or something. So no, we wouldn't have any people fighting over it. And so, uh, I think it's, instead of spiritually dead, it's that it's, it's kind of nasty, but it's that basically it's being converted into uh, being acting like a spiritual generator in a converter that is being yes. of receiving the, the power of our own spirituality and our own creation it's being routed and siphoned off to the degree where, where our spirituality and our bio etheric forms, our bio emissions, our minds, our reality generating processes being used for basically other individuals who have found a way to not literally profit on it, profit off of it in terms of money, literally profit off of it maybe to add some some spooky Hollywood stuff in there in terms of Jupiter ascending where yes. they, they figured out a way to pull the life energy from the people constantly hoping for, trying for, putting themselves out there and then watching it basically just get swept away by the tides and, uh, and they basically, uh, you know, and again, I don't want to go too deep. I know you said we, we can't really, but uh, they, they basically found a way to not only survive off of it, but to more or less use it like a drug. And to Which, use it it's, it's, what, it's, it's, it's uh, basically okay. loose harvesting. And, yeah. you know, people have called it different things over, over time. Uh, Robert Monroe originated the term loose harvesting back in the 70s in his books. And um, our friend Kara St. Louis calls it the apex predator, which is, a, you know, she defines it as a singular entity, but it is in fact, a, in my opinion, a collective entity that subsists off of the energetic of genuine spiritual sentient human living beings. And what they get from us uh, is generated at different levels of our, our, our physiology our, our psychology, our sexuality, our, our overall energetic field on an ongoing basis. So, you know, when I look at this, I look at the events that are going on. I, you know, the examples being just for a, a, a big example is obviously the political scene, which, which encompasses everything and how people are emotionally pulled into a vortex in a way that they begin to generate huge power. And, and Emily and I have talked about this a lot because we saw it in our lives personally, and we saw it in social media, how polarizing this all was, even though we didn't stake out, quote, political positions, but pointing out to people, you know, repeatedly, you know, you've got to understand this is not your government. This is a corporation. Your financial system is controlled in tears going up a ladder. I mean, everybody stops at the Rothschilds or the, or the 13 families of the three families, and they don't understand that, 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 that ascending pyramidal hierarchy is really all collateralizing this energetic in a way that keeps us both fixated in this three-dimensional plane and all the activities that go on here, and at the same time, we generate all of the, the, the economic power, the political power, all the juice that they need to keep the system running. Absolutely. I'm going to jump in here for a second. You guys both hit on a number of things. I don't even know where to start. So maybe we'll start with one and backtrack on some. There's something I, what, what Aug started off with in terms of uh, how he described the, the sort of physics and happenings of accessing places in the secret space program. Uh, I want to get back to that in a second, but for what you just said, Randy, um, I can't, I can't think of a bigger louche buffet than this vagina march that they just had yeah. oh, this, this past week because you had all these people, you had all this energy created. And so you had, you know, here at a time when there's, we should be paying attention 
in a completely different way than this to a lot of fem like feminine energy that is coming in right now and possibilities with that. Here you have it totally distracted off to this other thing. You have, so you have all this energy being created. You have it being sexualized in a, an almost caricature perverse kind of way with all these women wearing crotches on their heads, which actually, if you really think about it, the, it ends up looking like some of this artwork we've seen on some of these disgusting uh, pizza place walls and stuff lately, right? So, and then you have celebrities there. You have just this congestion in downtown cities that already are distorted, architect distorted sacred geometry, energy generator kinds of things. So you have all of this, it, all of this stuff coming together. And, you know, I've had to, you know, I have family members who, joined in on that who think it's very important and they feel very empowered by having done that. And like what you said, um, uh, that if we tell them the truth, we're insulting them. You know, they've, they've heard it from me before and they find what I have to say to be insulting. And obviously I just hear all about them crazy and stuff like that. And what I've finally just had to do with this is kind of understand that like they're on their journey. And, you know, I, I think in other lifetimes and other spaces and places, I've already gone through that process. And so I'm doing something different now. I have to let them go through it. I just, I have to tell them the truth. I do tell them the truth. And at the same time, I tell them the truth. I finish that with, but, and I love you, you know what I mean? Instead of just so that they understand and I'm getting a lot better response from people than when I used to just sort of go on and on about why, you know, they're wrong about this, that, and the other thing. But people, it scares me that people feel so empowered by what went on this past weekend um, and just have, or there's millions of people so clueless to the fact that it was actually, you know, a feast for entities and energies that exist right outside of their visible, visible perception. You know, how that operates is just a, a weird concept. Maybe the easiest way, especially for others to understand is that in the, the longer term, if you will, the, the aspect of perception in the physical sense that's outside of what we call the now, time is current, you know, uh, continuously branching. And the more, like we discussed in our first conversation, the more actions and um, choices are made to veer the branching of time towards a less self-aware general you know spectrum the more these other entities if you will have control because in the very far end of what our civilization results in there's more of a likelihood that they'll end up coming about as some type of maybe subdegrade a subhuman form of like degrading evolution or de-evolution and so besides the fact that people can talk about it in sense of uh something that's going on right now with these entities existing, you know, outside of a, a plane of perception and literally physically taking in uh, energy. And then, uh, yeah, basically we're looking at self-degradation being made yeah. appealing and, and appealing, if you will, actually, to people who are looking for self-empowerment. And yeah. it's a fool's game because uh, it's not how it's basically going to work. And then uh, to, to really wrap up what I'm saying and the, the power of kind of your perspective here is that the fear-based programming, the trauma-based, I always try to write notes. I've actually started to use outlines again, just take me back from high school and <laughs> college, which is, yeah, I'm using it more now than I was to get stuff I heard you there. say. I heard you say when we were on the conference with uh, the, on the Millennials Conference, you were, you were doing mind mapping. Oh, yeah. I, that, that, I do that, too. I've got software. I, I rarely use it because I do everything on paper. But the idea of mind mapping is interesting because it takes you – it's almost like what you were talking about. This is tangential now, but we do this, folks. The, 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 the degradation of people who are making these, these, these decisions inside the matrix system where they're degrading themselves. And the cool thing about mind mapping is that you can take a kernel of an idea – and begin to work it out like in a flowchart manner and begin to branch off all of these different potentialities. Now, I don't want to pull you too far off of where we're going here, but I'm fascinated by the concept, and I always have been, that as we are generating thoughts in our head, we are generating thought forms, most of which are 
unrealized. So that constantly grabbing focus back onto processes that we're working through and, and putting them in a con concrete form enables us to begin to manifest those things in a certain way or to put them in a place where they can later go back and kind of be grabbed onto because we've lost so much data. And, you know, I, I think Emily and I have talked about this. I've talked about this with most of the people who have been through any type of projects for the last seven years that most people were not unlocked. Most people retrieve memories very gradually at a certain age when programming begins to break down. And so a lot of people have these late life schizophrenic moments of doubt where the memories start to come in, but they really have not been able to develop them or create any kind of continuity with them. It's kind of like uh, trying to put together a film from snippets of other films and then try to see if you can make a linear reality out of it. And I know I'm, I know I'm branching off here a little bit, but when you talked about being unlocked, did you have a sense that there was a continuum in terms of being able to access the experiences and the memories that, let's just say, maybe before that were kind of phantoms to you starting back when you were a child? Yeah. I was going to finish what I was saying real quick and get to that because this is probably going to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, go. This is, it's going to go right into where we would want to take it. But um, the fear-based programming, trauma-based mind control, and then the important thing is to stay out of the victim role because that's where it is one is required to position themselves for it to work. And then the you know important part for those who feel like they're waking up is to stay healing, stay in a healer role, and stay benevolent no matter how much people piss you off and how far behind they seem. We got to remember not to start you know kicking people's asses mentally, physically, or emotionally just because we can see through the the BS and they're still you know scrounged around. If anything, mm -hmm. they're scrounged around because they're hurt and damaged and they need help, even though in the disposition they're not willing to accept it yet. So we just, it's a test of endurance for those who are really kind of learning to attain this type of healer aspect, which is, you know, one of the biggest uh, obstacles, especially, you know, aside from ego, which is kind of connects to the ego, but, but picking up the, this awareness. And so then in my opinion, so then the fact that there are basically, we're kind of in a multitude matrix system with multiple time streams and, and, and realities that are just outside of our perceptual boundaries and that uh, I heard uh, somebody gave this example. I actually heard it from the bases the first time. But usually what we see in the bases is, you know, kind of it, it, they either tell people similarly and then those people are the people we're seeing out here or they're getting it from out here. It's, it's kind of both because, that, you know, the part of that is that there's multiple time streams and a lot of them are centering like a nexus around these yeah. these uh, underground bases, these portal sites, basically. And so you'll have every, you'll have access to all these time streams there where, you know, it would seem like you're mirroring reality uh, if you were there, but in reality, you could also say uh, in reality, you could also the external reality out here is mirroring this information. They're streaming through these, these sites like a nexus point, like they're basically vortexes that operate in and out of multiple dimensions. And then they're using that, you know, because that's like a information highway for the, the universe or at least the galaxy at that point, which is where you would want to be. You want to position your equipment there and all your people there because that would be, you know, that's gold. Um, and so, uh, well, one of the explanations is that this was a talk for, man, it was the, uh, it's about the control system. I'll have to look it up. I'll probably put a link. It was basically about how the control system, the financial debt slavery system, the, um, and all that, the legal fiction and all that stuff. But he, he used the example and I've heard this before. That's why I'm also going to bring it up because it's not purely from someone else. Uh, more so out here is that basically it's reality in this. Well, see, and he's also describing, cause I'll take it a bunch of different ways. He's describing, the control system and the financial system primarily that it's like a jigsaw puzzle and it's like you have three of them and it's like somebody mixes them all up in one big uh one big uh, pile and then you have a certain amount of time to complete it whereas normally you have the picture at first that you kind of put piece each piece together and these you know these other families they're yeah. the ones that have the picture. i go so that no one's going to get that answer unless that you're an inside guy or something mm -hmm. But my take on that is that this is basically how a uh, holographic consciousness works in this, this multitude, this multiplexed time stream 
overall, uh, you know, higher dimensional reality that we can only perceive one slice of at a time through our physical forms, our, our brains and bodies. And um, so in that sense, there's, you know, there, it, it's literally like a matrix where we have one stream that we have access to, but the variables or parameters, it, it goes heavily into reality as a simulation as well. The parameters which lock us into that one stream are simply based upon our choices and our tendencies over time to basically lock ourselves into specific habits or routines or way frequencies, ways of, of perceiving reality. And that simply by, ch you don't really travel to a new place to get there. You change your perspective and change your behavior. And in doing that, you're accessing these other realities because in a way they're versions of you or maybe just like those bases are the nexus point through which all these spiral realities center upon our actual decision-making process within that's where our access to all these other realities center around. And so uh, it's, you know, with the un unlocking or the awakening with these other, these devices that allow that to happen with all the information from, from ancient uh, Gnosis and these spiritual texts, it's kind of confusing. It's pretty much uh, in the sense of, like you said, phant like a phantom matrix where there's multitudes and uh, the, the reality behind it, the one that we perceive as being the one that exists is when you get to a one, when you get to a little bit larger schematics or parameters than the, what we're using now, that line between what is the one that we're experiencing now and what is the one that could have been, it begins to blur to the point where there's really no difference between them. It's just a matter of perspective. Like you're kind of twisting a, a jeweled uh, object in higher space. And as soon as you rotate a little bit off angle, one way or the other, the reality that we see now shifts and it's just as solid. It's just that this physical form does not have access to that unless you have a, a vortex that you developed or a, 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 a mountain that has a natural vortex area in that, that you can mm -hmm. actually walk through. Yeah. But mentally, you can gain access to that, and it's pretty confusing because the the you know to wrap this up into something digestible for you know people who haven't really partaken in these types of conversations or experiences. If you have technology that can access these other realms, reality basically becomes this type of rolodex where you can flip through page after page, layer after layer of slight difference between one and the other, and it's literally it's it's like a library where each book is a version of earth and each page is one of your particular perspectives of reality. And then the library just spirals up and down in a staircase kind of version. It goes both ways. And so it never ends. And it's, it's, that's one of the most difficult things for people to comprehend because then when people are like, well, what's the meaning of this? Who made this? What are we supposed to do or not supposed to do? There's really no answer there. It's just a content is whatever you want and whatever you want to make it to be. And you know, there's ultimate power in that, but in the same sense, it drives people mad knowing that if they were to basically accept that they didn't have the power in that and that it could be whatever they want it to be, but that they don't know what to be, then it will be something that they don't want. It'll be something unpredictable, it'll be something chaotic. And so ultimately then what we gain from that is for these alchemists, you know, maybe these, these uh, beneficial or maybe benevolent to use a kind of or more lighthearted term, occultists have uh, learned and taught is that the whole idea of what to do and what not to do is to take chaos as it is in your life and to turn it into order and, and self-empowerment and meaning and to take the, the seed, the raw materials of what you can gain empathy and knowledge and creation from and give it the right elements that allow it to bloom and flower into something beneficial that you can basically pass on to others or can sustain itself and reproduce itself and becomes a perfect form of existence and life like your own body. Because we didn't create our bodies no matter how much we want to say that's what we did and that's what we are. If anything, we found these bodies and that's how it works. And so, but without, you know, without having that background, it's literally just whatever you want. And that gets pretty crazy because right now people have a, a big oppressive system over their heads, crushing them down saying, you know, do this, do that, but don't do anything else. And they're still not getting it right. They're still, <laughs> the, the, we're still hitting themselves. 
in the, the crotch with the hammer, like Joe Rogan says, when all you have to do is <laughs> use your mind constructively and the tools and resources you have to create something beneficial for yourself. You can make a house you go sit in. Just if people want to kick up leaves and dirt and, and mess with each other. So, you know, it's a really weird, challenging, intellectually challenging and ultimately spiritually challenging situation, but it's not a, a spiritual trap in that regards. It, but that is where, you know, to wrap that up, that is where the idea of the spiritual trap comes from. The labyrinth, the multidimensional mirrored hallway, the fun house of the physical reality. Because if you go in and you forget the way you came in, then you might not ever get out. Or it might take millions upon billions of years to get out of this physical matrix. And at that point, one would be very thankful and one would want to hope that they're still the same being coming out as they were the one going in. Of course, they'll learn, but you would, you know, you would hope you would still have the memory of who you were at that point. And that's kind of what we're facing here in the most, it's pretty much the deepest you can get here, where humanity is in this, we're in this situation where a few people, a few groups that you can come select whatever you want, basically found a pathway out, and they're competing more or less, spiritually battling with those that said, F it, we're not trying to get out. We're just going to try and lord over those that are stuck in with us for as long as we can until the sun goes out. And, uh, and we're in this interplay now. We're with this, this uh, crossroads where we're going to see what we're going to do and who's going to do what, where, when, and how, and, and why. Wow. That was really, that was, that you know, you just echoed there one of, my worst really night, <laughs> one of my worst nightmares, which was basically this recurring I called it a dream, um, but I think it was, I think I was getting reverberations back from something I experienced that was basically where you go out into an infinity and you look forward and there's an expanse and you look backward and realize you don't know what point you came from anymore. And there was always the fear until what came in and it was, it, it always happened was the soul always knows how to go home. And once I folded back into that idea, into my own inner space, then I was dropped back into, you know, terror. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. I was, uh, what, what you, when, the way you just broke that all down, it made me think of, and tell me if, if I'm sort of right on with kind of what you're saying is, so I've been having this weird experience lately and it's not the, well, I told you about one of them in our last conversation, but this is something that's been happening repetitively, like in recent weeks. And I don't think I've told you this before, Og, but maybe you probably know this about me, that I was a gymnast. I was a competitive gymnast. And I was good, but I wasn't like super duper amazing. I did it in college and stuff. But lately I've been having almost, I don't know how to explain it, like memories of a different and alternate gymnastics career where I worked a little harder and I was a little more successful and I achieved more of the things that I wanted to. But it isn't like I'm well, well, well aware of the reality of what my gymnastics career in this reality was. But th this doesn't feel like other things I've had in the past that were fantasies. This almost felt like me peering into one of those other slight yeah. variations of realities and actually being there and feeling it and experiencing that, not to just be fantasy and delusional, but with the, to, so that I can internalize the understanding of what you're speaking of. Where I do have access to those kinds of possibilities. And even though that wasn't the reality for this reality, that all of those kinds of things that that reality was achieving, I can still do. I'm not saying this perfectly right, but I'm starting to understand that like having access to these other versions of memories. These the are past. other aspects of yourself. Yes, it's other yeah. aspects of myself where I'm accessing the me from a, the next dimension over, the next reality over, and that these are all part of me. They're all, they're all a part of me. They're not something totally different. And that I can use all of these kind of experiences to generate from here forward the reality that I want based on the experiences from the variety, the various different realities, timelines, dimensions, whatever. What do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we've all had some version of that. And probably if you've had some experience with these types of situations and scenarios, you get it a little bit more. And if you will say a, a little bit better to the point where it's not just like a dream that felt really weird and real, but it's like you snap into the grid of the memories of that existence yes. and you're literally that person for a yes. period of time. And, uh, and, you know, you can like draw it out on a, on a, on a map, if you will, how those 
feeling is different and how your personality was kind of, you know, same general idea, but a different, you know, different life experience. You have a different like kind of outlook. And uh, I would believe, you know, the idea, so the idea with the projects is that those who have been through those, their versions in these other realities are stabilized. Yeah. That they're not just outward and, you know, out there to the point where, say, you know, you finish your mission here, you could probably be given a retirement plan where you have access to the reality that you choose, um, which is really weird, but that's kind of how it works, where you can uh, – Basically, me, there's a lot of people abusing these systems and creating like the, I don't know, the, the weirdest reality of power and, and, and whatnot. Basically, it's usually the weird version of power is not self-empowerment, but chaos is power over another and it's over another by chaos over another. And so there's a lot of people who take that route and they want the, you know, want to take that route. And then, you know, these, you, you don't, no one needs to cause chaos on another if their true desire is self-empowerment. And truly, to want self-empowerment is to not have desire because desire takes us out of self-empowerment. Yep. It's almost like saying, you know, what do you desire when you've gotten rid of all desires? And so kind of paradoxical in that sense, but that, you know, that means that it can be done anywhere. Whereas if you have this type of outward inclination towards material power, it always has to come from someone else. It has to come from somewhere. If everyone was rich, people wouldn't want wealth because it wouldn't mean wouldn't mean anything. And so that's why we have the scarcity system because those that want to be rich, well, they have to have poor people in order to feel that power from, from right. all that money. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so I would say that everybody has this Rolodex aspect aspect to all realities, multiple timelines, and the people that have been through these experiences often, or just natural uh, adepts, basically. They, they often have these types of solidified versions where they're essentially stabilized because of this one being stabilized. And uh, it's really weird. It's like, it's like concurrently existing across multiple planes and dimensions, you know, more than people just say that we're in these other realities and this, that, and the other, but that there are, are there, you know, maybe there was a project in that reality and in some CIA building, just like they tap AT&T and all that, they're tapping the, ether of, the Ethernet of Earth and in one of those, you know, data stream servers, all of our, you know, links are being filtered through. And because they're kept stabilized for the majority of the time that we're present in this dimension, it's literally like having an operator system where you could call up and dial, dial into these other realities and, you know, phone home, if you will. And, uh, you know, we don't have the keys, but other people have keys and they don't usually play around with them. But they go in, there's operators that go in and they have access to accessing them to going through a device that sends them into the other reality. And it's not just like, well, wherever you go, you know, send us a letter. Hopefully it'll get here. <laughs> it's, it's mapped out. They have these grids that map things out and it kind of looks almost looks like uh, visualizers for uh, waveforms for, yeah. for music, but there'll be yeah. versions of realities laid out de de defined by frequency and the relative difference or, or distance from this reality or to this reality. And, uh, and so, so a lot of people, at least that have these experiences get the really strange, powerfully vivid effect of these other realities and the other experiences. And it's probably because there are concurrent realities taking place where things are, things are taking place. Operations are happening in both of them. And uh, the, the main idea, maybe I can leave this part of the conversation from, or with, excuse my, my fumbling over words tonight is that uh, we're in this one for a reason. There are, usually it seems that these other ones will have like, the, it's so fun. But if you say you, that one got like kidnapped just to make things, you know, a little bit abrasive so that we can bring it to the extremes so that we can be definitive about what's really going on. The one that was focusing on that, you know, the you, she gets kidnapped. She's probably gonna freak out a little bit more than the you here who has had these types of experiences that might be a little bit more basically a little bit more hardened to the, the truth behind what's going on. And then, you know, say so nothing bad happens with getting kidnapped, but say they just, they take her in for uh, a testing and a trip chair adventure and she gets sent this one real quick and sent back. She's not going to be too keen on understanding and having reality cracked open. Whereas you can go to that one, and come back just fine. That one would be like a vacation compared to this one. Yeah. So we're in this one because this is where all the hard work is taking place. And it doesn't mean all these other ones are BS, but, uh, 
the, the pain kind of, you know, the, the stuff we've been through here is, is for a reason because they're collecting it here because uh, it's, it's useful. And uh, if, if the stuff does hit the fan, it, we're going to want people who are capable of handling this versus a bunch of people that are kind of just like floating along, you know, down the river because that's just what we're inclined to do naturally, which, you know, we're really not. But when everyone else is sitting ducks, we kind of just go with the flow. We get in the lazy river. You know, if nothing was like going on like that, we'd probably be out, you know, meeting every so often in the desert and communing with their ancestors and having the same type of deep experiences that people would have anyway when they're they're really trying to figure out about reality. It doesn't mean we need these projects to to get down to the nitty gritty and be able to handle these this basically this darkness that's going on in the world. But with the way things have been, the rest of the world is basically not too in tune with that. And uh, so in, in that, you know, in this case, the, these projects, these, these experiences were stronger for having gone through a lot of these things. Yeah. And so this is most likely going to add in a, one way or another, indirectly or directly, something beneficial to this world because, you know, it's, it's better to be able to withstand what's possibly coming or what we've been through versus not being able to. It's always better. As long as we're here now and we can complain, whether it's one way or the other, that means it's better. Because when it's not, you can't complain, then you don't get the chance of, of wondering about it. And you're, you just know. You just sit there and you just know it's fucked. Excuse yeah. my language. You can cut that out. <laughs> but that's what it is. You know, and there are a lot of people that are born into those situations. And, you know, and it's not even nobody put in there from projects. It's just that's how their genetics went. No. So, you know, as long as we can complain about it, then it's cool. And I'm not saying you were or anything, but... I'm sure I know what you're talking about because I'm sure you kind of, you kind of think like maybe it would be awesome if I was just like stuck in that reality instead of this one and everything was different. And you know, there's always a, a different feel. Maybe not. No, I, yeah, no, I, no I, go ahead. The idea is that apparently this one is kind of eventually going to switch over to those. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, my feeling wasn't like it, it's, it's fascinating because I've been since this has been going on for several well, it's been going on for several months now, like intensely, but like it really um, like my level of like awareness of exactly when it's happening and what it is has become becoming increasingly more. Um, but no, I don't, I don't have the desire to stay there. Like I, I feel it's interesting and I sort of observe and, and take lessons and, and learn from it. And cause you know, they're valuable. Um, but I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm exactly where I want to be. Like, I feel like I'm here right now doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing and any of the uncomfortable, hard, gross, tough, weird, strange experiences that I've been through uh, brought me to this spot to be able to be, you know, doing what I'm doing, ready for, you know, ready for something if it's coming and being able to hold my own when things happen. You know, maybe that other, that other me was more successful in gymnastics, but maybe she would still be thrown by some of these things. And I feel much less likely to be thrown by things these days than, than I used to be. And so whatever, whatever the experiences are that brought me to this place, this is, I'm here for exactly the reason that you said before. So can I amplify that a little bit? Cause you, you what I heard you say, Emily, was that you, the other me, you treat the other me as, like an alien self. Is that how you feel? I, no. We've talked about this because one of my suspicions has been that a lot of what went on in trauma-based mind control programs was, yes, it was splitting personalities. It was splitting the psyche. It was splintering off operatives that could be obviously <laughs> switched on, used, and then switched back off. But I've also suspected the multidimensional aspect of this was largely to access into the powers of the other me's, the other yep. you's. Yep. And so from my standpoint, this really goes back to childhood because I had the strange alienation of this me. Because to me, this me always felt alien and other me's felt real. And as I've gotten older, I've gotten, a, oddly enough, a stranger connection where some of that integrates back in, where yeah. I sense aspects of myself that are, quote, out there but really aren't out there they fold in in a certain weird kind of way that is it's psychic and there's there's a personality aspect of it of things that the quote me that's here is not 
but those other selves are those things which are probable selves that exist in parallel or even kind of moving in and out of a, a kind of time dilation system. So, yeah. I, you know, and I, language really does fail us at this point. I mean, we're just, you oh. know, <laughs> totally. I don't know. I mean, I, what, what do you think about that? I think a lot. Um, all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like what you just said because you're, you're, you're touching on it now which is uh, closer to what's really going on here. Um, yep. So they can use the connection. Like I said, our link is in that server system. Well, they can transfer energy from these other cells. These are the realities. They yep. can pull them. If we need to be kept alive, they can basically pull energy from a parallel and incorporate it here. And yeah. uh, it, as strange as it is, it doesn't necessarily mean that the other parallel is basically being erased. It's, it basically has like a null factor effect because these are probable realities that are not made real until yes. we enter ourselves into this computer grid of the universe, which is the strangest thing. And then there are parallels that are concurrently occurring, and this is through the time dilation that you kind of just mentioned. You just slipped in there because you had to. <laughs> <laughs> we love talking about time dilation. <laughs> but there's technology and there's possibilities that – one can enter just like one has a dream in this reality where we go to bed and one can have two weeks or years sometimes of experience exactly. in this dream reality yeah. and then they pop back. Yep. So what that did or does is creates a time bubble where there's like a loop, there's a temporal uh, dilate, that's through time dilation. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's theories as well as, you know, I've seen some, some stuff. So there's other civilizations or imagine we all get into a, you know, tri-person group here, but we're in person. And we have the, the art mastered of being able to kind of enter into each other's dreams. Mm. So then imagine by getting into a, just like you can get lost. Like sensei, of, basically. Well, for sure, because that's yeah. the basis of all of this, that the, the mind masters, you know, to use that word master, which not a lot of people will like. But that's the, the meaning of all of this, that if we, we're all that anyway, if we just get on, you know, what we could be doing and could be achieving, we'd have mastery over all these things that are just happening to us. Yeah. yeah. And that always makes it very interesting because if, you know, there's other civilizations that do this where we could be all in a circle and holding hands or connected in some way with crystals of some sort, whatever you want to call it. And by going into a meditative state, just like the monks would, um, and, and we have the ability to enter into each other's dream. Well, imagine we can then go into this time dilated experience where we're basically generating a world of our own in this server system of the universe. And we spend a year, two years real time in that other world, yeah. just like we, we do every night when we dream here. We yeah. don't have yeah. a two year dream every night, but possibly we could. And, uh, and by willpower, we can dilate time in order to have these experiences yeah. This equates to basically super learning, uh, out-of-body experiences, accessing parallels, um, contacting, you know, ancestors and going into genetic memory and having access to these other yeah. Yeah. World experiences and other times and, and all of that. So the idea is if we could do that at will, then we would be able to consciously generate a time bubble, a time dilation, and use that to our advantage to to basically better ourselves. We automatically do that when we dream, especially when that necessity for such an experience builds up within us and then it happens automatically. And then there's the advanced technology that enables one to do that by basically suspending parts of their mind from, from reintegrating into this dimension, reality, physical uh, sense, uh, linear sense of uh, time, if you will, continu continuity. And if you can suspend that, while activating the imaginative parts of your, your mind, well, then you can go into a controlled deviation from this reality for an amount of time. For, it would be like a, having the matrix program where you can plug into something, have a simulated experience, and come out. Yeah. So now the, the kicker is that what if essentially that's all that maybe death or near-death experiences or in, in a sense the parallels that we kind of have a glimpse of what if those are basically time dilate glimpses of time dilated occurrences yeah. that exist in between moment of each death, if you will, or each 
continuous flittering of ourselves in this reality that we're at a certain frame rate, like we talked about on that uh, chat with uh, yeah. Lily Kipling and, and friends, that we're at angular momentum hitting the clock at a certain time, and we don't see the whole other, you know, 359 degrees of that spherical uh, circular rotation, but we just catch it at a certain degree, at a certain rate each time. And so now we have this frame rate where we're catching the, uh, the lines of the television, if you will, the frames, at a, and we get this reality as a result. So what if the other realities that we're experiencing are every other degree on that angular momentum or every other frame rate on that viewing system apparatus? And right now they're happening right now. If we, you know, shift our perspective just a little bit, we'll catch all those other ones yes. that are not yeah. really far off in another existence, another time. They're happening concurrently here and now, but they're separated by astronomical time deviations or time Ooh. dilations as it would seem to our perspective here now, we would, only, we would only experience it by going from this one, wrapping around, experiencing that one, and coming back. So the only way to get from one universe to the next is through these extreme universal time dilations or time bubbles.